I know Damien has a number of friends and family that have joined us in support of his decision today. And if you would like to, you're welcome to come up here on the platform and stand on my left. We have an area right up here that you're welcome to be uh, a part of this service. I know this has been something that you've looked forward to, Damien, for a long time. In fact, you've been waiting so that your family could celebrate this with you. And so we praise God that they are able to be with us. Wow. He said, he said about 20. He, he said about 20. I think he got it right. I think he got it right. But this just shows you that none of us live our lives to ourselves. What we do affects other people. And you have it in your power to affect people for the good or for the evil. Today, the decisions that you have made forever settles that question. That you want people to follow you as you follow Jesus. So there is a lot riding on the decision and commitment that you're making today. We're not praying for just a, st a strong start. We're praying for a strong finish. We believe that God is able to keep you from falling. And one day he will present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And so today, Damien, because you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have committed your life to follow him as a disciple of Jesus. It's our privilege today to baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, for the remission and forgiveness of all of your sin, and now for a brand new life in Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Cool. All right. Thank you. What a blessing so far, right? All right, I want to invite you to get out your word or your tablet or your phone or whatever it is you use to follow along. Our media team is stretched a little thin because of the 4th of July, and I'm not sure that they're going to be able to bring up all the scriptures because we're missing a few people. And besides that, if you're following along with YouVersion, the Bible app, there may be two messages out there. How many of you received the email I sent yesterday? A number of you did, and I told everybody what I was preaching about, and I thought I was done. I thought I was done. You know, 5 o'clock, and things are and it's just between 5 and 6. I just really sensed God wanted to go in a different direction. So uh, I was up late last night she, it, trying to figure out exactly what God wanted, and I think I'm going to endeavor to be faithful to what he wants. So I know there's someone here that this is your message. I know that. And so I want to pray that we will receive that. Father in heaven, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for what we've already experienced. And so, Lord, as we take a few moments now and open your word, Father, we pray that you would take away all the distractions. We want to hear your voice. We want to know what it is that you're saying to us. We will share in the experiences of others as we read from the, from the Bible their experience. But Lord, we know you have something to say to us. So I pray that you would help us to hear that clearly. And Lord, if you would do that, we'll commit right now to do whatever you ask us to do. To go wherever you ask us to go. Because we want to serve you with all our hearts. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark chapter 1. So there may be two messages out there, is what I was saying on the, on the U version. There may be two messages. One on Jonah, a whale of a story. Skip that one. And you should find one entitled, Follow Me. Follow Me. That's what I want to talk about. It's taken from Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. I'd invite you to turn in your Bible to Mark 1. And we're going to read verses 16 through 18. Mark 1, 16 through 18. 
All right, well, this is close. It has the graphic for last week, but we'll ignore that. Thank you for being able to pull that up. For those of you that don't have a Bible, here's what we're reading. Verse 16, and he said, or excuse me, and as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. And they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. Now, I have to admit, I've preached on this passage before. And most of the time, when I've looked at this passage, I've gone in the same direction. And there is a great message here that illustrates what God wants to do in our life. That he wants us to be useful for his kingdom. There is a work of God going on in the world today. Can you say amen? And it's not going to fizzle, and it's not going to slowly fade away. It's going to grow in intensity. And God is raising up an army of workers that are going to answer the call and that are going to be used in a powerful way. And so that could be one sermon, but we're going to go, as I said, in a slightly different direction. You know, I always thought this story was a little peculiar because it just, it's just the gospel starts out with almost very little introduction, and all of a sudden Jesus sees two, two guys fishing, and he says, basically, stop what you're doing and follow me. And almost like in a trance, they throw everything down and they begin to follow Jesus. And, and, and you're, you're left with this idea, it could it really be like that? Or is there something more? You see, I don't believe that they were strangers. This wasn't the first time they had heard of Jesus. This isn't maybe even the first time that they knew a little bit about his ministry. John the Baptist had come earlier, and John was preaching about the coming Messiah. He was preaching about the one who would come. And so all of Judea was filled with this this, uh, anticipation of what might happen. And so... When, when uh, Simon and Andrew see Jesus and he, and he bids them to drop their nets and to follow him, there was obviously some information that they had had. You see, the reason I bring this up is their call to follow Jesus isn't much different than ours. I believe all of us, we reach that point in time in which if we will listen, we will hear Jesus speak through the Holy Spirit. And simply this, that whatever you might be doing that would prevent you from following him, he says, you need to lay that down. Now, I don't believe that everybody has to be a preacher. Everybody has to be a teacher. Everybody has to be a missionary. That's not what this is about. But in some way, all of us have to be followers of Jesus. That's what his will is for our life. And so I believe through all of this backstory, there comes a time and a place where it's not enough to hear about Jesus. It's not even enough to follow him from afar. It's not enough to listen to some of his messages. There comes a time when it's you and him, when it's just you and Jesus. And through the voice of the Holy Spirit, he'll say, Tierra, follow me. Joy, follow me. And that's a defining moment in our life. I mean, that is, at that point, it can change everything. For the good or not for the good, depending on how you answer. You see, just the way he calls them, I believe he calls us today. I believe before you ever are bid to follow Jesus, Jesus is working in your life. Jesus doesn't expect you to follow him when you don't know anything about him. He has a way of working in your life even before you become a follower of God. He gives you enough evidence that he is faithful, that he is trustworthy, that he is a loving, compassionate, merciful, graceful God. You know, as many of us that have made that decision to follow Jesus, as we look back, we see, wow, God was really working in my life before I gave my heart to him. And, and you know, we see that maybe for months and years, but we don't see it with the clarity when we're living it. It's often when we look back, but, but know this, God will bring us to that place when he will make that invitation. And the question is, how will we respond? You know, I believe that we can know Jesus casually 
from a distance. But you can't really know him. You know, as I was kind of sharing with Damien, it's not enough to simply look on the people of God. It's not enough to just look as a spectator. There comes a moment when you have to connect yourself and commit yourself. I believe that you can only know him slightly through books and even through sermons. We get to know more and more about him. But I am absolutely convinced the way you know Jesus best is by following him. You know, you just can't explain to someone what it means to be a follower. You know, as a follower, you try to give your testimony, and and people don't get it sometimes. People that have not yet surrendered their life, I mean, they see it, and they hear it, and it sounds good, but you can't explain it. There's some things that can only be experienced. And I believe that by following Jesus, that's when we know him the best. So there's three things that I want to share with you about this call of Simon and and Andrew, that I want us to notice. Three things, three lessons, and three observations that I think are important for us to understand before we leave today. And here's number one. Through this, this short invitation, we learn what it means to follow. Verse 17 again. Again, we're looking at the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 17. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Look, there were a lot of religious people of the day. There were a lot of prophets that would come. And often the message of a prophet was, follow God. That's what they usually said. Follow God or follow righteousness or follow the law. The message of Jesus was different because Jesus was uniquely able to say to anyone and everyone, follow me. I like that. I like that. Because it tells us it's different than anything else. Jesus says, follow me. It wasn't just that he was a representative, although he was. It wasn't just that he was there as a leader. He is that person in which we are to follow. He's not simply trying to help us to understand who God is from a distance, but by him personally coming and bidding us to follow him, we get to know God through the person of Jesus Christ. We know him intimately because he is God. So that's an important distinction because Jesus was establishing himself as a leader. Secondly, Jesus was telling us that the life of a disciple is not just knowledge. It's not just a theological understanding. It's not just a doctrinal understanding. That's important because I think sometimes we have a way of letting religion get in the way of our spirituality. And Jesus was all about making people spiritual. Religion's not a bad thing. But a religion can be a substitute for being spiritual, and you don't want that. Don't settle for one without the other. See, Jesus was telling us the life of disciples is not just about what you think. It's not just about even what you know. It's not discussing theological principles in Sabbath school class. That's not what being a disciple is all about. It's about a life that's being lived out as a follower of Jesus. I think this is important today. I think this is crucial today because a lot of the gospel that we hear out there is just trying to tell people what Jesus did. And if you will simply know what Jesus did long ago, that will change your life. And I believe knowledge is important. It's important what we know and understand about Jesus, but there is something deeper here. Jesus didn't invite those disciples, learn of me know about me, he said to them and he says to us today, follow me, follow me. It has to be more than just believing. The gospel that will change people, that will transform lives, is not just knowing about Jesus. Knowing about Jesus is good but it's not a substitute for following Jesus. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew 7, you know, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in thy name and in thy name cast out devil in thy... These are people that knew about Jesus, but their lives were not changed. You see, it's not enough to believe. I believe in the devil. I know that he is real, 
and I know a lot about him, but that does not make me a devil follower. You can have a knowledge and not be a follower. I think the church is full of people that have been led to believe all we have to do is to know about Jesus, but Jesus says, follow me. There comes a time when you've got to get off your seat, get on your feet, get down the street, and live for Jesus. To follow him wherever he goes, whatever he asks you to do. When Jesus said, follow me, he was saying, go where I go. Do what I do. Say what I say. Live like I live. You know what he's doing? He's, he's inviting us to become imitators of Jesus. You know, we can have day-long, week-long, month-long discussions about what it means to be a disciple. But at the heart of it, it is about living like Jesus, thinking like Jesus, acting like Jesus, doing what Jesus did. Everything else is commentary. It is commentary. We need to make this as simple as we can, and Jesus knew how to do that. It only took him two words. Follow me. You know what? It's on the job training. Jesus doesn't say you got to learn all this stuff before you can follow me. He doesn't say you got to clean up before you follow me. He doesn't say you've got to prove yourself worthy to become a follower of me. He said, no, you can follow me right here, right now. Follow me. If you're trying to figure out, what is this Christian life all about? It's that simple. Begin to follow Jesus. Seems rather basic, rather obvious thing to say, but there's been too many Christian situations where we lose sight that we are to do and act and think and talk like Jesus. Just this week, I had a terrible conversation with somebody that we were engaging in business. And I was talking to him about something, and he brought it up, and, and he was not necessarily a religious person, but he made a comment because he does a lot of work with churches. He's in a business that does certain things, and he, and he just took a moment, and he shared. He said, you know what? Church people are the worst. They are the worst. They will be dishonest, they will try to take advantage of people. Now, I don't believe this, but, but there's probably some element of truth. It was real for him. I think he was on. He was saying, they believe the ends will justify the means. It's not true. That is not true. Jesus was all about not just the end, but the means. You live like Jesus. You talk like him. You do all those things, and people won't say that. I had the same thing happen in, in, a, in another place. I was, I was working on behalf of a church to try to buy a commercial property to turn it into a church because where we were at, there were no church buildings. And the real estate, the commercial real estate, he wasn't a church guy. He was a commercial real estate. And when he found out I was a pastor, he said, I don't do business with churches. He said, I've done that once, and I'm not going back. And again, the idea is somehow we think because we represent God, we can take advantage of other people. Jesus says, follow me. That's what the world needs. It doesn't need to hear all the things that we think or, or, or all of that. It needs to see Jesus in us. We need to follow Jesus not only when we're here in this building. We need to follow him when we leave and go home and when we go to work and we go to the market. That's what it's all about. You see, Jesus didn't call us first to lead for him, to conquer for him. He called us first to follow him. Don't make this more complicated than it is. Following Jesus. You know, there's probably very few situations that you face in life where if you're really honest, you don't know what Jesus would do. You know what he would do. You know how he would respond. You know how he would act. You know what he would say. The real issue is not that we don't know what Jesus would do. It's often we don't want to do what Jesus would do. We want to do our own thing. Jesus says, follow me. One of the defining characteristics that Jesus said, by this, people are going to know that you're real. 
By this people will know you're my followers. By this shall all men know you're my disciples. What did he say? If you love one another, follow Jesus. It'll change your life. And that leads me to number two. The second observation we see in that short call to be a follower is how your life can have meaning. Meaning. That's an important word as you get older. You know, when you're young, money is an important word. Hey, I've been there, done that. I don't, I don't fault, that's kind of what we think about. That's what we see as success in life. Money and the things that it buys. But as we get a little older, money gives way to meaning. We want our life to have meaning. I mean, think about it. For 40, 50, 60, 70 years, however long it is, you're going to get up and you're going to work in life. If you're not working in the job, you're going to be working at home. You're going to be working. You're going to be you know, checking things off your list. You're never going to be done with everything. And you're going to end the day the same way all the time, realizing that there's still more to do. It's a grind. Do you ever feel like one of those gerbils? You know, when I was a kid, you had gerbils or I think they were called gerbils. Hamsters. Hamsters whatever they are, and they run on that little wheel. And man, you know, that dumb gerbil thinks that if he can just go faster, he'll get somewhere. I've caught myself running on that wheel and just having a moment of clarity and realizing I'm running after the wrong things. Meaning is what's really important as you get older. You want to live a life of meaning and purpose. And if you're in that place, I'm going to tell you, there's, there's really nowhere else you can go but Jesus. Jesus has a way of bringing meaning to your life, of bringing a greater purpose. I think that's all of us want. We want, us, we want something bigger than we are. And Jesus will allow you to be a part of that. John, again, Mark chapter 1, verse 17, Then Jesus said to him, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. We don't think about it, but Jesus was a fisherman. He fished all the time. He saw everywhere he looked people that he wanted to catch for the kingdom of God. He was inviting these disciples to be a part of that. One of my favorite stories is Steve Jobs. You know, the late Steve Jobs, as he started out, Apple Corporation as a co-founder, it reached a point where he was no longer able to serve in that chief executive role, and he had to go get someone else. And it was Scully that was actually running Pepsi-Cola at the time. Pepsi-Cola, big, you know, the the Cokes, or we call them Cokes where I grew up, but the sodas, the the Pepsi. And And he pitched Scully with the idea of coming and being the chief executive of Apple Corporation. Of course, at that time, Apple was not what we know it to be, but it certainly showed promise, and it showed that it had a vision to change the way people related to each other and whatever. I mean, if you ever really think about it, the vision of Apple, was not, it's not an accident that Apple became who they were. It was because of their vision, and they lived it out, and they pursued it relentlessly. And as, as Jobs is sharing that with Scully, he said, well, I've got a good job at Pepsi-Cola. And Jobs looks at him and says, you mean you would rather sell brown sugared water the rest of your life than to come join us and change the world? I don't know exactly what happened in that conversation, but when he walked out, He resigned at Pepsi-Cola, and he began to run the Apple company because it appealed to him, this idea to give your life meaning and to give your life purpose. That's what the Christian life is about. It's no ordinary life. You know that. I mean, God calls you to something bigger than you are. He calls you to greatness. Now, it's not so much you being great, but he calls you to a great cause. He calls you to a great purpose. You and I are involved in the greatest work this earth will ever see. I mean, I know there's been some great medical achievement, there's been some great business achievement and all of that, but none of that compares to the work of the church. The work that the church has been given by Christ is the greatest work of all. And you and I get to be a part of it if we become followers 
of Jesus. That's why Jesus called us Andrew and Simon was so compelling. He said instead of fishing for fish, I'll help you fish for men. I'll help you change lives. I'm going to use you to change lives. That's exactly what the call of the gospel is to you and I today. Don't just be a church member. Be a follower of Jesus. He left in his wake people that were different. After they met Jesus, they were different. Their lives were changed. They would never be the same. And that's what our lives can be like today. Our life will go from mediocrity to meaningful. Here's the third lesson we learn in that short call. Begin today. Right where you're at. Right now. In verse 18 he says, after Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men, what did they do? They... No, they didn't just leave their nets. There's another word there. Don't skip over that. That's the most operative word. That's how you follow Jesus, by the way. You do it immediately. You do it here. You do it now. You do it right away, at once, without delay. I'm sure they didn't wake up that morning and had a plan in place to follow Jesus. It was, it was spontaneous. But they knew. They knew the defining moment had come. The invitation was given. What would they do? And immediately, they left their nets and followed him. They didn't wait. They started right where they were. You start today without delay. You don't sit down and think about it. When Jesus ask you to do something, you do it. I, I don't know why some people, well, I'm going to have to pray about that. Now, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa. You know that's what God wants you to do? You know that's what the Holy Spirit is leading you to do? And you want to stop and pause and pray about it? Look, I have nothing, I have nothing against prayer. Prayer will give you clarity. P prayer will help you to discern the Word of God, and the will of God. That's all good. When you're fuzzy, pray. But when you hear the voice of God, you go. Amen. The only thing you need to pray about is pray as you go that you'll be faithful in what you're doing. Yes. <laughs> but we use, you know, we get all spiritual. We're going to pray about it. You know what you're really saying is? No. You're saying no. You're saying no. Any delay is saying no. Not now is no. And that's our favorite answer to Jesus. Not now. We're going to keep the door open. Oh, Lord, one day I'm going to do something great for you. One day I'm going to get involved in ministry. I'm going to be like those others that I've always admired. One day I'm going to be a follower of God. One day I'm going to read the Bible. One day I'm going to be a part of God's work. One day I'm going to get involved in ministry. One day I'm going to return my time. Oh, I, you know, I've heard it all. And you probably have too. One day. Some day. Scripture says, and they immediately left their nets. You know what, as far as I could tell, there's nothing about these two guys that qualified them for what Jesus asked them to do. Nothing. They probably hadn't been to school. They were not the most learned people of all. They certainly weren't the most respected in society. Oh, don't get me wrong, there was nothing wrong with being a fisherman. They were a part of productive society. There's nothing wrong with that. But of all the people that Jesus could have called, why them? I think it's because they were willing to follow. They were ready. Their moment had come, and there's only one way to do it, and that is start today. You don't want to vacillate on this, friends, because God doesn't, 
Well, the Bible speaks pretty harshly about those that vacillate on making a decision for Jesus. You see, that's the way it's been from the very beginning. Our God is one who calls. Our God invites. And we as a, as a people, it's always about excuses. It's always about all the things and all the reasons that we cannot do it. Here in Matthew chapter 8, verse 21, well, Jesus talks about this. Another disciple said to him, Lord, let me first go bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it? Hey, this poor guy had to go bury his dad. That's not what we're talking about here. Nobody believes that. The custom and the, the way he said that was, you know what, my father's going to kick off pretty soon. And I need to take care of things at home. And, and you know, there's probably a pretty good inheritance that's coming my way. And if I leave now, I might miss that. Let me get set. Let me get all my ducks in a row, and then I'll follow you. Have you ever heard that before? Yeah. I hear it all the time. I hear it all the time. Let me, let me clean up first. Let me get my life straightened out. Let me get this or that taken care of. I want you to know I've never met anybody that's been able to do that on their own. I've met a lot of people. A lot of people have offered that. Pastor... I'm going to follow God. I just need to do all of this first. They've never come to me and said, I got my life straightened out. Now I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. Don't do it on your own because you can't. You're just going to become frustrated. There's no power that you have available to you to straighten your life out. When Jesus says, follow him, follow him, he takes care of you. He will take you to that place and grow you and do in you that which is needed, just follow Him. Some of you have been believers for years. You're here today because you believe in Jesus. You're here today maybe even because you love Him. I believe that. But I'm asking you today, are you a follower? No not just do you attend, not just do you pay your tithe or do other things, but is your life looking more and more like Jesus because you've committed, I want to be a follower of him. I want to begin to act and to think and to do and to talk like Jesus. That is what I'm asking you to commit to today. Would you be willing to do that? Is the Holy Spirit saying to you, follow me and I will give your life meaning. I will give your life purpose. Follow me and I will make everything work in your life the way it should. Follow me and I will grow you into the disciple that I created you to be that you will never be able to reach except as you follow me. The day came when God called me to be a disciple. There was nothing in me that made me feel like I would be successful except the promise of God that he would work in me to will and to do of his good pleasure, that God would give me gifts to be used in service. And I said yes to that decision, and I've been walking. And, and, and throughout my experience of walking with Jesus, I hear a call here, and I hear a call there. And I want you to know that we need to train ourselves to hear that call. And when we hear it, to follow it. This morning, I want to give you the same invitation. Will you be a follower of Jesus?